Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, today we will be talking on uterus. I am Dr. Daksha Dikshit, Professor of Anatomy, Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College, Kaili Academy of Higher Education and Research, Belagavi. Let us see a case scenario. A 60 year old female complained that she has been feeling the sensation of something coming down into the vagina since the past two months. She also complained of increased frequency of micturition and dribbling of urine on coughing. On per vaginal examination, the gynecologist found the descent of cervix into the vagina and also the presence of cystocele. And the diagnosis given was of uterovaginal prolapse. What is seen here in the schematic picture is the uterus which has descended down through the introitus and also part of the urinary bladder which is said to form a cystocele. Let us just keep this in mind so that as we go through the lecture we will understand why these symptoms have occurred and what is the cause. We will be studying the uterus under these following headings. Introduction, shape, size, position, the gross features, body, cervix of uterus, the relations, both the peritoneal relations and the visceral relations, the blood supply which will include the arterial supply and the venous drainage, the lymphatic drainage, the nerve supply, the supports of the uterus and finally we will see the applied anatomy points. Introduction Uterus also known as hystera or womb in the common man's term. It is a hollow thick walled muscular organ, pear shaped or pyriform in shape, it is anteroposteriorly compressed. It is located in the pelvis anterior to the rectum and postero inferior to the urinary bladder. A non gravid or a nulliparous uterus means a uterus of a female who has never conceived measures about 7.5 centimeters in length, 5 centimeters in breadth and 2.5 centimeters anteroposteriorly and weighs about 90 grams. The normal position of this non-gravid nulliparous uterus is said to be that of antiversion and antiflexion. This is seen when the urinary bladder as well as the rectum are empty. Let us see the anatomical disposition of the uterus. This picture shows us a lateral view through the pelvis. Anteriorly, we can see the pubic symphysis. Moving posterior to it, we see the urinary bladder, the urethra, and the urethral opening inferiorly. Posterior to this we can see the uterus, the fallopian tubes above and the ovary. We trace the uterus inferiorly, we see the cervix part of the uterus and then the vagina opening inferiorly as the vaginal orifice in the introitus. More posteriorly, we can see the rectum which opens at the anal opening. What are also seen here are the labium minus or the labia minora and outer to that is the labia majors or the labia majora. So, this shows us how the uterus is disposed in between the urinary bladder which lies anteriorly and the rectum which lies posterior to it. What is also seen here is the position of the uterus. The uterus 
is slightly bent anteriorly and forwards on the urinary bladder. This picture shows us the anatomical disposition. The non-gravid or nulliparous uterus is said to be anti-verted and anti-flexed in position. Now what is this anti-version and anti-flexion? Anti-version is the forward bending of the cervix as compared to the axis of the vagina. So anti-version is an angle which is made by the long axis of the vaginal canal with the long axis of the cervical canal and that measures 90 degrees. So anti-version is the forward bending of the cervical canal as compared to the vaginal canal and that is about 90 degrees. Whereas anti-flexion is the forward bending of the cervical canal as compared to the body of the uterus. What is seen here is the plane passing through the body of the uterus which makes an angle with the plane passing through the cervical canal and that bending is about 125 degrees. A schematic picture to show us the same. The angle that the plane of vagina makes with the plane of cervix a forward bending angle of 90 degrees is anti-version whereas the angle made by the plane of the cervix with the plane of the body again an anterior or forward bending angle of 125 degrees is the anti-flexion. So normal non-gravid uterus a nulli paras uterus is positioned as anti-verted and anti-flexed. So that is the anatomical disposition of the uterus. Let us now go on to see the gross features of the uterus. The uterus is said to have three parts. The fundus which is the uppermost part, then comes the body of the uterus and lowermost is the cervix of the uterus. The fundus is the rounded region which lies superior to the openings of the two uterine tubes or fallopian tubes. From the opening of the fallopian tubes, when we move down and reach the narrow constriction which is the isthmus that is nothing but the upper one third of the cervix, this part from the openings of the fallopian tubes up to the isthmus part of the cervix constitutes the body of the uterus whereas the lower one third of the uterus is the cervix. So parts of the uterus fundus which is the rounded region superior to the entrance of the uterine tubes, the body or the corpus uteri forms the upper two thirds and is the major portion between the entrance of the fallopian tubes and the isthmus of the cervix and the third part is the cervix or the cervix uteri which forms the lower one third and is tubular structure between two openings that is the internal os above and the external os below. The internal os is an opening seen at the upper part of the cervix through which the cervix communicates with the uterine cavity whereas the external os is an opening seen at the inferior end of the cervix through which the cervix communicates with the vaginal canal. Isthmus as I said is the narrow upper one third of the cervix. The body of the uterus shows presence of a cavity which is called as the uterine cavity. This cavity looks like a vertical slit on a sagittal section. It looks like a transverse slit on a transverse section. This is because the body of the uterus is andro-posteriorly compressed whereas 
on a coronal section the cavity of the uterus is seen as triangular in shape with its base pointed superiorly connecting the two openings of the fallopian tubes and the apex of this triangle is pointed inferiorly and ends at the internal os. Like the body, the cervix also has a cavity which is known as the cervical canal. The cervical canal is a fusiform shaped cavity having anterior and posterior walls and its upper end is at the internal os and its lower end is at the external os. The same parts of the uterus are seen in this diagram. What we see here is the upper rounded dome shaped part of the uterus which is the fundus which is extending above the openings of the two fallopian tubes. From this part when we move downwards towards the narrow isthmus of the cervix this entire part is the body of the uterus and the lower part of the uterus the lower one third is the cervix part of the uterus. Other structures which are also seen here are the two fallopian tubes, the ovary, the suspensory ligament of the ovary, the round ligament of the ovary, these lateral or superolateral ends of the uterus are known as the angles of the uterus or the cornua. The cornua of the uterus attaches or gives attachment to the round ligament of the ovary while its lateral end is connected to the pole of the ovary. These peritoneal folds which are seen here laterally extending from the lateral border of the uterus and going towards the lateral pelvic wall. This bilaminar fold of peritoneum is the broad ligament. A similar peritoneal fold is seen attached to the fallopian tubes and that is called as the mesosalpings and a similar fold of peritoneum connecting the ovary to the posterior layer of the broad ligament is the mesovarium. Another picture showing you the internal structures of the uterus seeing through as a coronal section passing through the uterus. What we see here again is the fundus or the upper part of the uterus part above the two openings of the fallopian tubes. Below that we see the body of the uterus extending from the openings of the fallopian tube up to the isthmus part of the cervix. The body of the uterus measures about 3.5 centimeters. The isthmus measures about 0.5 centimeters. Lower down we see the cervix part of the uterus extending from the internal os to the external os. The cervix measures about 2.5 centimeters in length. As is seen here that the lower part of the cervix is surrounded by some part of the vaginal wall or the roof of the vagina is surrounding the lower part of the cervix. It is this that divides the cervix into two parts an upper part which is called as the supravaginal part whereas the lower part which is surrounded by the roof of the vagina is the vaginal part of the cervix. So, cervix uteri has two parts an upper supravaginal part and an inferior vaginal part and the part of the vaginal roof which surrounds the cervix is called as the vaginal phonix. The vagina all around is encircling the lower part of the cervix thus this vaginal phonix can be divided into four parts an anterior phonix, a posterior phonix and two lateral phonices. What is also seen here is the opening of the external os. It is different in a nulliparous uterus and as compared to the multiparous uterus. In a nulliparous uterus, the external os is seen as a rounded opening. 
whereas in a multipara it is seen as a transverse slit having an anterior and posterior lip. Let us move on to study the cervix part of the uterus. The cervix has got a narrow neck which projects into the vagina inferiorly. The cervical canal or the cavity of the cervix communicates with the vagina via the external os inferiorly and superiorly it communicates with the uterine cavity via the internal os. The cervical glands which are seen on the mucosal surface of the cervix secrete mucus which covers the external os and blocks the sperm entry except during the mid ovarian cycle. Let us see the structure of the cervical canal. We see the, here that the cervical canal is fusiform in shape and has got two walls, an anterior wall and a posterior wall. The wall shows a midline longitudinal mucosal fold and from this mucosal fold we see a number of obliquely running smaller mucosal folds which are travelling upwards and laterally. These are the palmate folds. This gives the characteristic appearance of a branching pattern which is known as the arbor vitae uteri. The folds which are seen on the anterior wall are reciprocally seen as grooves on the posterior wall thus occluding the cervical canal and closing the cervix completely. Let us now see the other structures related to the uterus. Uterus and adnexa as they are called. These adnexa are nothing but the fallopian tubes and the ovaries. What is seen here is again the structure of the uterus showing the three parts that is the fundus, the body of the uterus and the cervix. What is also seen is a section showing the interior of the uterus, showing the uterine cavity which is a triangular structure on a coronal section. It also shows the cervical canal and inferiorly it shows the vagina which is a muscular bag like structure. We can also see part of the vagina which is encircling the lower part of the cervix and that is what we call as the vaginal phonics. What are also seen here starting from the angle of the uterus is the fallopian tube. The fallopian tube is about 10 centimeters in length, has got a medial end which is attached to the cornua or the angles of the uterus and it has got a lateral funnel shaped free end. The fallopian tube can be said to have four parts starting from medial going on to the lateral aspect. The medial most part of the fallopian tube is a narrow intramural part which lies between the uterine musculature. Next comes a narrow part called the isthmus. Further laterally is a dilated part of the fallopian tube called the ampulla and the lateral most part is called as the infundibulum which is a funnel shaped lateral end of the fallopian tube. This funnel shaped infundibulum ends as finger like processes which are called as fimbria. One such fimbria is a long fimbria which also takes attachment to the ovary and is called as the ovarian fimbria. Again revising the parts of the fallopian tube, four parts, the medial most is the intramural part, then is the narrow isthmus, then is the dilated ampullary part and lateral most is the infundibulum which ends in the fimbriated funnel shaped pattern and is closely related to the ovaries. The ampulla part of the fallopian tube is a normal site of fertilization. Let us now move on to see the broad ligament of the uterus. The uterus as we have said has got 
two surfaces that is anterior and posterior surface and it has got two lateral borders taking attachment to the lateral borders of the uterus and moving laterally as a bilaminar fold of peritoneum going towards the lateral pelvic wall is the broad ligament. As is seen here in the picture, this quadrangular shaped bilaminar fold of peritoneum is the broad ligament. It is said to have two surfaces, an anterior surface and a posterior surface and four borders, a superior border, an inferior border, a medial border and a lateral border. The superior border is the one which is going to encircle the fallopian tubes and that part is called as the mesosalpings. Whereas the inferior border is what is going to take attachment to the floor of the pelvis. The medial border is what takes attachment at the lateral border of the uterus whereas the lateral border is what will take attachment with the lateral pelvic wall. The anterior wall is smooth whereas the posterior wall shows another modification of peritoneum which goes to enclose the ovaries as a bilaminar fold of peritoneum known as the mesovarium. Let us see a section passing through the broad ligament and the cut section is going to show these structures. Right on top we see the fallopian tube as a cross section and a bilaminar fold of peritoneum which has encircled the fallopian tube. It is part of the broad ligament known as the mesosalpings. What is seen here is the anterior wall of the broad ligament not showing any modifications whereas the posterior wall of the broad ligament shows this bilaminar fold of peritoneum which has encircled the entire ovary and that is what is called as the mesovarium. So, here we have seen three peritoneal folds related to the uterus, the broad ligament, the mesosalpings and the mesovarium. We move on to see the peritoneal relations of the uterus. We are again seeing a lateral view of the pelvic cavity. There are two important peritoneal relations as far as the uterus is concerned. When we trace the peritoneum from the posterior aspect, we see the fold of peritoneum which is going to cover the anterior surface of the rectum and it then reaches or goes from the rectum onto the posterior part of the isthmus part of the cervix and then moves upwards, covers the posterior surface of the body of uterus. It covers the fundus of the uterus coming onto the anterior surface of the body of uterus, goes right down up to the vaginal part of the cervix and from there, from the anterior phonix of the vagina, it reflects anteriorly onto the urinary bladder, covers the superior surface of the urinary bladder and then goes on to the anterior abdominal wall. So, we see two peritoneal reflections here, one which is seen posteriorly which goes from the rectum onto the uterus. So, that is the recto uterine pouch of peritoneum or the pouch of Douglas. Similarly, anteriorly the point where the peritoneum reflects from the vaginal fornix onto the urinary bladder, we see a fold of peritoneum called the vasicouterine pouch of peritoneum. So, peritoneal relations of the uterus in an anteroposterior direction are two that is the recto uterine pouch of Douglas posteriorly between the rectum and the uterus and the vasico uterine pouch which is seen anteriorly between the uterus and the urinary bladder. Same peritoneal relations seen as a schematic picture let us see these also it is again a lateral view through the pelvic cavity. Anteriorly we see the pubic symphysis the anterior abdominal wall, the back of the pubis, then we see the three viscera 
that is anterior most is the urinary bladder then is the uterus and the cervix and posterior most is the rectum what is seen here anteriorly between the urinary bladder and the uterus is the vesico uterine pouch and what is seen posteriorly between the uterus and the rectum is the recto uterine pouch or pouch of douglas also seen here is the peritoneum covering the rectum and also is seen the mesentery of the pelvic colon so with this we have done with the peritoneal relations of uterus let us see the visceral relations of uterus the uterus as we know rests anteriorly on the urinary bladder so what we see here is the urinary bladder continuing down as the urethra it forms the anterior relation of the body and cervix of the uterus the posterior surface of the uterus and the cervix is related to the rectum posteriorly and postero superiorly to the sigmoid colon and the coils of small intestine so those are the visceral relations of the uterus the other features which are seen in this diagram anteriorly is seen the pubic symphysis posterior to it is the urinary bladder continuing down as the urethra more posteriorly we see the uterus continuing as the cervix the vagina and the vaginal orifice related to the vaginal orifice we see the bulb of vestibule and the greater vestibular glands which will be related to the labia minora seen superolaterally from the angles of the uterus we see the fallopian tube and the ovaries and posteriorly we see the rectum which is going to continue down to the anal opening so these show the visceral relations of the uterus let us see the structure of the uterus the uterus is composed of three layers outermost is the perimetrium which is the serous layer the visceral peritoneum layer next is the thick myometrium which is the middle layer showing interlacing fibers of smooth muscle and the innermost layer is the endometrium which is the mucosal lining of the uterine cavity the endometrium can be divided into the epithelium and the lamina propria the epithelium before the age of puberty is lined by ciliated columnar epithelium whereas after puberty the lining epithelium is simple columnar epithelium the picture here shows a histological view of the structure of the uterus the luminal surface shows the epithelium part of the endometrium as we have said it is lined by simple columnar epithelium deep to that we see the thick lamina propria the lamina propria here shows the presence of the uterine glands the blood vessels the lymphatics and the nerve plexuses when we see the endometrium we can divide it into two parts a basal part which is nearer to the myometrium which shows the base of the uterine glands it's also called as the stratum basalis it is the lower one third of the endometrium which shows presence of the radical or the straight arteries the upper two thirds or the two thirds of the endometrium nearer to the luminal surface is called the functional layer or the stratum functionalis this shows the spiral arteries and this is the part of the endometrium which is shed during the menstrual cycle the functional layer then regrows and builds up the stratum functionalis going to the next layer that is the myometrium this is the layer which is showing the interlacing fibers of smooth muscle these are arranged again in three layers 
the innermost reticular layer, the middle circular layer and the outer longitudinal layer. The middle circular layer is characteristic because it shows the presence of blood vessels which are there in between the circularly arranged smooth muscle fibers. These blood vessels help in blood supply plus during vasoconstriction it is the smooth muscle fibers which will compress the blood vessels and help in vasoconstriction and will prevent further bleeding and thus this circular layer of the smooth muscle fibers acts as a living ligature of the uterus. The myometrium can thus be said to have three different zones. A zone which is there in the center having the vascular layer, it is called as the vasculosum and there is a layer deep to the vascular layer, the subvasculosa and a layer above the vasculosa, the supravasculosa that shows the structure. Now we go on to see details of the endometrium as has already been said that the endometrium of the uterus has numerous uterine glands that change in length as the endometrial thickness changes. This as I said can be divided into two strata, the stratum functionalis and the stratum basalis. The stratum functionalis undergoes cyclic changes in response to the ovarian hormones and it is this layer which is shed during menstruation whereas the stratum basalis forms or will give rise to the new functionalis after the menstruation ends. It is the stratum basalis which does not respond to the ovarian hormones. Let us see another picture which shows us the uterine histology. What we see here is the uterine cavity or the luminal surface. Related to that is the endometrium showing the lining epithelium which is made up of simple columnar epithelium. Deeper to that is the lamina propria which shows presence of the uterine glands. And this can be divided into an upper two thirds which is the functional zone and a deeper one third which is the basilar zone. So the entire endometrium can be divided into the stratum basilae which is the basal zone the lower one third and the luminal two thirds which form the functional zone. Deep to that we see the myometrium which is a thick layer of interlacing fibers of smooth muscles. What is also seen here is the arrangement of the smooth muscle fibers which arrange in a whirl like pattern. What is also seen here is that some of these smooth muscle fibers can contribute to formation of the ligaments which are seen around the uterus. For example, the transverse cervical ligament which is seen attached to the lateral border of the uterus will have some of these fibers which contribute to formation of the fibromuscular structure of these ligaments. Similarly, some of these muscles interlacing fibers may also contribute to formation of the vaginal wall musculature. Let us now go on to see the arterial supply of the uterus. The uterus is supplied by two blood vessels, the uterine arteries and the ovarian arteries. The uterine arteries arise from the anterior division of the internal iliac artery. They ascend on the sides of the uterus and enter into the broad ligament. They then branch and send branches into the uterine wall. These branches are the arcuate arteries. These are the branches of the uterine arteries in the myometrium that give rise further to the radical or the straight branches. 
the radical branches descend further into the endometrium and will give rise to the spiral arteries and the straight arteries. The spiral arteries which are seen in the stratum functionalis whereas the straight arteries which are seen in the stratum basalis. Degeneration and regeneration of the spiral arteries causes the endometrium to be shed off during the menstruation. This shows us the arterial supply of the uterus. Two pairs of vessels, the uterine artery which we said is a branch of the anterior division of internal iliac artery and the ovarian artery which is a direct branch coming from the abdominal iota. The uterine artery is seen at the lower part as is seen here, it ascends in the broad ligament along the lateral border of the uterus. It has got a tortuous course. This tortuosity is required as it allows the expansion of the uterus during the pregnancy. It goes upwards along the lateral border of the uterus. The uterine artery is going to anastomose with the ovarian artery which descends down from above. The ovarian artery which we said is a branch coming from the abdominal iota. So, the uterine artery as well as the ovarian artery take care of blood supply of the uterus, the fallopian tubes and the ovaries. What is seen here is an important relation of the uterine artery with the ureter. The ureter is said to be present about 2 cm lateral to the isthmus part of the cervix. And the uterine artery is said to cross the ureter from lateral to medial side traveling above and anterior to the ureter. This relation has to be kept in mind. It is an important relation of the ureter. Let us now see the venous drainage of the uterus. The veins of the endometrium are thin walled with occasional sinusoidal enlargements. The uterus is drained by a pair of uterine veins and a pair of ovarian veins. The uterine veins will drain the blood from the uterus and terminate into the internal iliac veins. Whereas, the ovarian veins, the termination is different on the right and the left side. The right ovarian vein ascends up into the abdominal cavity and terminates in the inferior vena cava. Whereas, the left ovarian vein ascends in the abdominal cavity and drains into the left renal vein. What is seen here in the picture is the right uterine vein which we see as terminating into the right internal iliac vein and similarly the left uterine vein terminating into the left internal iliac vein. The ovarian veins are also seen here which ascend up from the lateral borders of the uterus. The right ovarian vein will ascend into the abdominal cavity and drain its blood in the inferior vena cava, whereas the left ovarian vein will ascend in the abdominal cavity and drain its blood into the left renal vein. Let us move on to see the lymphatic drainage of the uterus. As is seen here in the picture, the lymphatics from the fundus part of the uterus are drained superiorly into the paraiotic group of lymph nodes. The body of the uterus, the upper part of the body of the uterus drains the lymph into the external iliac group of lymph nodes. Occasionally, a part of it may also drain into the superficial inguinal group of lymph nodes. The lymphatics from the lower part of the body of the uterus will drain into the internal iliac group of lymph nodes. Let us see the lymphatic drainage of the cervix. This is a section passing through the cervix. The lymphatics from the lateral part of the cervix will be drained into the external iliac group of lymph nodes. Posterolaterally, the cervix drains the lymph into the internal iliac group of lymph nodes, whereas posteriorly, the lymphatics will drain into the sacral group of lymph nodes. 
Let us now go on to see the nerve supply of the uterus. The uterus is supplied by the inferior hypogastric plexus. The cervix is supplied by a plexus that contains small paracervical ganglia. Sometimes one such ganglion is larger and is also called as the uterine cervical ganglion. The uterus gets the sympathetic nerve supply from the spinal segments T12 to L1. These bring about uterine contraction and also cause vasoconstriction. The parasympathetic nerve supply is coming from the spinal segments S2 to S4. They relay in the paracervical ganglia. They are inhibitory to the uterine musculature and they cause vasodilatation. The uterine musculature also has hormonal control. Let us now go on to see the supports of the uterus. We can classify the supports of the uterus as is shown here in the schematic picture. Supports of the uterus can be classified as primary supports and secondary supports. The primary supports can further be classified as muscular or active supports and fibromuscular or mechanical supports. The muscular supports are the pelvic diaphragm, the perineal body and the urogenital diaphragm. The fibromuscular or mechanical supports include the transverse cervical ligament also known as the Mackendrott's ligament, the pubocervical ligament, the utrosacral ligament, the round ligament of uterus and the uterine axis. The secondary supports are the ligaments like the broad ligament, the utrovascical ligament and the rectovaginal ligament. There are other supports like the urinary bladder, the anorectal flexor which has the bracket action, the cervical cushion and the parametrial packing. Let us see a little bit about each of these supports. The pelvic diaphragm, it forms a strong muscular support seen in the floor of the pelvic cavity. It supports the uterus inferiorly. The levator ani muscle is nothing but the pelvic diaphragm which has got fibers which act as a hammock and sort of suspend or support the uterus from the anti inferior aspect. The perineal body is a strong support for the uterus. It is a fibromuscular node like structure seen in the floor of the pelvic wall. It has intersection of a number of muscle fibers which come from the muscles of the pelvic floor. It is a key muscle or a key structure maintaining the integrity of the pelvic floor. Next is the urogenital diaphragm which is also a muscular support seen in the pelvic floor. The fibromuscular supports like the transverse cervical ligament or the Mackendrott's ligament is a strong fibromuscular ligament which is going to extend laterally from the cervix as a fan shaped structure going on to the lateral pelvic wall. The pubocervicalis part of the levator ani muscle acts as a sling which is going to anchor the cervix to the pubic bone. The utrosacral ligament is another such sling coming from the posterior aspect and hooking or slinging the lower part of the uterus from the posterior part. These two ligaments, the pubocervical ligament and the utrosacral ligament act synergistically and sling the uterus from the anterior and the posterior parts and that helps in maintaining the position of antiversion and anti-flexion. This is nothing but the uterine axis. The normal uterine axis of antiversion and anti-flexion prevents the prolapse or downward descent of the uterus.
if this axis is modified or if the uterus instead of forward bending straightens up or bends posteriorly then such a straightened uterus or a backward bending uterus which is called as a retroflexed or a retroverted uterus has more chances of descending down and prolapsing through the introitus. So, these are the fibromuscular or mechanical supports that is the transverse cervical ligament or the McEnroth's ligament, the pubocervical sling from the anterior aspect, the uterosacral ligament from the posterior aspect, the round ligament of uterus, this is a fibromuscular structure which is attached to the angles or the cornua of the uterus. From here, these ligaments travel upwards and laterally, go along the pelvic brim, proceeding anteriorly, travel through the inguinal canal and end antero-inferiorly by attaching or ramifying in the labia majora. This round ligament of uterus is a remnant of the gubernaculum uteri. It helps as a anchor because it hooks, elevates and pulls forward the uterus from the antero superior aspect. So, thus acting as a mechanical support for the uterus. The secondary supports of the uterus are also called as false supports because these are just peritoneal folds like the broad ligament which has been already discussed previously attaches from the lateral borders of the uterus as a bilaminar fold of peritoneum going towards the lateral pelvic wall. The uterovesical ligament which goes from the uterus towards the urinary bladder. Similarly, the, the recto-vaginal ligament seen posteriorly, a reflection of peritoneum from the rectum onto the vagina posteriorly. So, these three are peritoneal folds, the broad ligament, the uterovesical ligament and the recto-vaginal ligaments. These are false supports since they are just peritoneal coverings. Let us see the pictures showing us these supports. What is seen here is the support of the uterus which is given by an empty urinary bladder. Empty urinary bladder is on which the uterus will bend forwards and rest. Thus, it gives mechanical support to the uterus. What is seen inferiorly here is the parametral packing. The uterus is seen and laterally we see the parametrial connective tissue. What is seen above here is the pelvic fascia which covers the parametrial tissue. Also seen here is a strong muscular support, the levator ani muscle which supports the uterus from the inferior aspect. This picture shows us the anorectal sling. A sling of anorectal muscle fibers of the levator ani which sling the uterus and hold it in position. What is also seen here is the puborectalis part of the levator ani muscle, again slinging the rectum. What is seen here is the cervical cushion, the uterus, the cervix part of the uterus which rests on the posterior wall of the vagina. And lower down here what we see is the uterine axis, the anti-version 90 degrees forward bending and the anti-flexion 125 degrees forward bending which act as the mechanical supports of the uterus. Another picture showing us the supports of the uterus. What is seen here is a transverse section through the pelvis. This is the anterior part showing the three viscera from anterior to posterior, the urinary bladder, the cervix and the rectum. Posterior most is the sacrum. We see the transverse cervical ligament or the McEnroth's ligament which extends from the cervix going laterally as a fan shaped fibromuscular structure and attaching to the lateral pelvic wall. 
Anteriorly, we see the pubo-cervical ligament which attaches the cervix to the pubic bone. Posteriorly, we see the uterosacral ligament which attaches the uterus posteriorly to the sacrum. These three are strong muscular supports of the uterus. Another strong muscular support which we see here as is seen in this coronal section is a levator ani muscle which supports like a hammock the uterus from the inferior aspect, the hammock action of the levator ani muscle. Same thing seen here, we see a coronal section passing through the pelvis, the levator ani muscle and in the center here we see the fibromuscular node like structure, the perineal body. The perineal body has the interlacing muscle fibers of the muscles of the pelvic floor. This maintains the integrity of the pelvic diaphragm or the levator ani muscle and that is how it supports or suspends the uterus in a hammock like manner. If this perineal body is damaged which normally occurs during childbirth, the integrity of the pelvic floor is lost and thus the uterus will very easily descend inferiorly and prolapse through the introitus. Another picture showing us the various components of the pelvic diaphragm or the levator ani muscle. A section going from anterior to posterior. This is the pubic symphysis which is seen anterior most. Posterior to it we see the pubovasicalis fibers. More posteriorly is the vagina which shows the pubovaginalis fibers. Posterior to this is the perineal body. More posteriorly is the rectum showing the puborectalis fibers. Anococcygeal body posteriorly showing the pubococcygeal fibers of the pelvic diaphragm. Laterally, we see the iliococcygeous fibers, the tendinous sling which is seen and posterior most we see the coccygeous muscle. These are the various components of the pelvic diaphragm. Let me repeat, anterior most is the pubic symphysis. Then we see the viscera that is the urinary bladder, posterior to it is the vagina and the rectum. Between the vagina and the rectum, we see the fibromuscular node, the perineal body and between the rectum and the sacrum, we see the anococcygeal body. The fibers of the pelvic diaphragm which are seen here, the pubovasicalis, the pubovaginalis, the puborectalis, the iliococcygeous fibers and the coccygeous fibers. Another way of classifying the anatomical supports of the uterus. Anatomical supports can be first classified into direct supports and indirect supports. The direct supports can be cl further classified into ligaments and muscles. Ligaments could be peritoneal and non-peritoneal. Peritoneal ligaments would be uterovesical ligament, the rectovaginal ligament and the broad ligament. The non-peritoneal ligaments would be the round ligament of uterus, the pubo-cervical part of the levator ani muscle, the transverse cervical or the McEnroth's ligament and the uterosacral ligament. The muscles would be the uterovesicalis and the uterosacralis. Indirect supports would be the posterior vaginal wall on which the antiverted uterus rests, the surrounding viscera like the urinary bladder, the levator ani muscle, the perineal body and the urogenital diaphragm. This picture shows us the supports of the uterus, the condensation of the pelvic fascia. Let us see the transverse section passing through the pelvis. Anteriorly is the pubic symphysis, posteriorly we see the sacral bone. The three viscera which are seen from anterior to posterior, the urinary bladder 
descending down as the urethra, the cervix part of the uterus and posteriorly is the rectum. What we see here going laterally from the cervix up to the lateral pelvic wall a fan shaped structure that is the transverse cervical ligament or the Mackendorff's ligament. Anteriorly we see the pubo cervical ligament and posteriorly we see the uterosacral ligament. A coronal section passing through the pelvis shows us the uterus, cervix and the vagina fallopian tube and the ovaries. Extending from the lateral wall of the uterus and going towards the pelvic wall is the broad ligament of the uterus. Inferiorly we see the transverse cervical ligament or the Mackendorff's ligament, the levator ani muscle with the fascia covering it and inferiorly we see the urogenital diaphragm. Let us now see the various positions of the uterus, the normal position as well as the abnormal positions. This is the anterior end showing the pubic symphysis, posterior to it is the urinary bladder, the uterus and posterior most is the rectum and the sacrum. What we see here is the normal position of the uterus that of antiversion and anti flexion. This anti flexion the forward bending of the cavity of the uterus as compared to the cervical canal. If this anti flexion is going backwards that is if the uterus instead of bending forwards goes backwards then that is what is called as the retroversion. The retroversion can be seen as 3 degrees as first degree retroversion, second degree retroversion and a third degree retroversion. This depends on the amount of backward bending that the body and the cervix of the uterus undertake. What we see here is a third degree retroversion that is almost altering the contour of the rectum because of the pressure which the uterus is having on the anterior surface of the rectum. So, this shows us the normal antiversion and antiflexion of the uterus and the 3 degrees of retroversion. Let us now see the age changes in the uterus. This picture shows us a newborn uterus where we can see that in a newborn the cervix is two times longer as compared to the length of the body of the uterus. Next we see the uterus of a 5 year old female child. At puberty what we see is the cervix length is lesser as compared to the length of the body. In an adult nulliparous uterus, the cervix measures only half as compared to the length of the body or in other words, the length of the body here is two times as compared to the length of the cervix. What we see in a newborn is exactly the opposite. So, in a newborn, the cervix measures twice in length as compared to the body of the uterus whereas in an adult nulliparous uterus the body of the uterus measures two times as compared to the length of the cervix. What is seen here is the bulky uterus which is seen in an adult parous woman whereas in an adult postmenopausal female the uterus is a slightly atrophied or it shrinks in size. These were the 8 changes in the uterus. Let us now go on to see the applied anatomy aspects of uterus. We would be studying the bimanual examination of uterus, the prolapse of the uterus, cervical cancers and cervical biopsy, colposcopy, caldoscopy, hysterosalpingography, pelvic laparoscopy, ultrasonography, hysteroscopy and hysterectomy.
the bimanual examination of the uterus. This is done to visualize the size and disposition of the uterus. It is done by introducing two gloved fingers superiorly into the vagina. The other hand is pressed inferoposteriorly on the pubic region of the anterior abdominal wall. This helps us in examining the size and the disposition of the uterus. The same is shown in the picture here. Two gloved fingers introduced into the vagina and another hand placed in the, on the anterior abdominal wall and pressed inferoposteriorly to have the feel of the size and disposition of the uterus. So, this is the bimanual examination of the uterus. Next, we see the varicose veins and hemorrhoids during pregnancy. These varicose veins and hemorrhoids which are seen during pregnancy occur commonly because of two reasons. The first is the pressure that the gravid uterus has on the inferior vena cava and on the inferior mesenteric vein thus impairing the venous return. And second is the increased progesterone levels in the blood during pregnancy which lead to relaxation of the smooth muscles in the walls of the veins and that is what leads to the venous dilatation. Let us now see the prolapse of the uterus. Anything going wrong with the supports of the uterus right from the damage to the muscles of the pelvic floor like the levator ani muscle, the urogenital diaphragm or the perineal body may be damaged during childbirth or if there is something going wrong with the normal uterine axis as we said earlier if an anti flexed uterus with gets straightened or gets retro flexed and retroverted such a uterus will easily descend downwards giving rise to prolapse of uterus. The prolapse of uterus can be of different degrees based on the amount of descent that the cervix and uterus undertake. That is seen in this diagram. What is seen here is the introitus. The first picture shows us a normally placed uterus, the uterus and the vagina. The first degree prolapse of uterus is wherein the cervix has descended into the vaginal cavity. Second degree is where the cervix has further descended and reached up to the introitus. A third degree prolapse is where the cervix is going to further descend and come out of the vagina and a complete descent or a procedentia is where the cervix along with part of the body of the uterus is going to descend and come out of the vagina. In most of the cases this procedentia is also accompanied by the prolapse of some part of the urinary bladder which is called as a cystocele or some part of the rectum may also descend and prolapse along with the uterus and that is called as a recto seal. What was seen in our case scenario was this procedentia with cystocele. It was descent of the cervix and body part of the uterus along with some part of the urinary bladder which was coming out of the vagina as a prolapse uterus along with a cystocele. If you remember it was seen in a 60 year old female patient who was a multi para. So, she must have had a number of deliveries giving rise to weakness of the muscles of the pelvic floor. When there is increased intra abdominal pressure as what occurs during micturation, defecation, coughing that is when the uterus will further be pushed outside and will further descend and come out of the vagina. These were the symptoms which were told by the female saying that the 
something coming out per vaginum increases on coughing. So, basically it is the uterus and the urinary bladder which further prolapses during increased intra-abdominal pressure which occurs during the coughing mechanism. Another picture showing us the prolapse of the uterus. Lateral views showing us slight descent of the uterus and the cervix which has descended into the vagina that is the first degree of prolapse. What we see here is the second degree of prolapse where the cervix has reached descended up to the introitus. What is seen here is a complete prolapse or a procedentia where the cervix along with the body of the uterus has descended through the introitus. Some part of the urinary bladder is also seen here as a cystocele. The next we see is the cervical cancers and the endometrial biopsy. Cervical cancers are common in females. They are the second most common carcinomas in the females, the first being the carcinoma of the breast. The cervical cancers are picked up with the help of biopsies. The endometrial tissue is taken as a biopsy specimen and is examined for presence of the carcinomatous cells. There are three types of cervical biopsies which are done, which are shown in this picture. The first part or the first type is what is called as a punch biopsy which is taken with the help of a forcep where a part of the cervical endometrium is punched out and taken for examination. The second type is called as the conus or the conal biopsy where a cervical cone type tissue is taken out with the help of a scalpel. This procedure is mostly done under general anesthesia or with local anesthesia. The third type is what is called as a curettage where an endometrial curette is introduced through the vagina and the cervix and a part of the endometrium is scooped out in order to be examined. So that is the cervical and endometrial biopsy, three types, punch biopsy, cone biopsy and the curettage. Next we see the procedure called as a colposcopy. Colposcopy is wherein the cervical part of the uterus is visualized with the help of an endoscope where we see a low power and high power views through the colposcope. They help us in seeing the transformation zone of the cervical mucosa. It helps in picking up the precancerous lesions of the cervix. What is seen here in the picture is application of 3% of acetic acid which helps in delineating the transformation zone. And what are seen here are the low power and the high power views which are seen through the colposcope which help us in picking up the epithelial tissue showing the transformation which is the precancerous lesions. The next we see is caldoscopy. Now, caldoscopy is done with the patient being in the knee chest position and a non-flexible endoscope is introduced through the vagina and it is taken up to the posterior vaginal phonix. Through this phonix, the caldoscope can further be introduced into the peritoneal cavity to get a bit better view of the fallopian tubes and the ovaries. What is seen here is the ovarian and the fallopian tubes as are seen at the time of ovulation. Apart from visualizing the interior of the peritoneal cavity through the caldoscope, this mechanism or this procedure can also be used to drain an abscess which is collection of pus which is sad times seen in the pouch of Douglas. That is what is shown here in this lateral view. What is seen here is a calde sac like abscess which is seen in the recto uterine pouch of Douglas. Such an abscess can be drained by using the colposcopy procedure where 
it can be drained through the posterior fornix of the vagina. So, that is about the colposcopy procedure. We now move on to see another procedure that is the hysterosalpingography. It is a radiological procedure seen to test the patency of the fallopian tubes. It is done in infertile females where we need to check for the patency of the fallopian tubes. A plastic cannula is introduced into the vagina and a radio opaque dye is injected into the cervix which will further go into the uterine cavity and through the two angles it will enter into the fallopian tubes. The dye has to travel through the entire fallopian tube and if the tube is patent, the dye will ultimately spill out from the lateral fimbriated end of the fallopian tube and this is seen as a spillage of dye into the peritoneal cavity. The same is shown here in the picture. The first picture here shows us the cannula which is introduced into the vagina and up to the cervix. The dye which is then introduced into the cervical cavity will further travel through the fallopian tubes and will get spilled out from the fimbriated end of the fallopian tubes. The picture here below shows us the patent fallopian tubes. What is seen in white here is the triangular uterine cavity. The dye has travelled through the fallopian tubes on both the sides and has spilled into the peritoneal cavity. This spillage shows us or tells us that the tubes are patent. It indicates the patency of the fallopian tubes. Whereas what is seen in this other picture here is that the dye has only filled the uterine cavity and has not entered into the fallopian tubes. This is indicative of a block in the fallopian tubes. So, this procedure is hysterosalpingography done to visualize or check the patency of the fallopian tubes. Next, we move on to a procedure called as pelvic laparoscopy. A laparoscope instrument is used to visualize the interior of the abdominal cavity. To do this, we need to inflate the abdominal cavity, create a pneumoperitoneum by introduction of carbon dioxide gas. Once the pneumoperitoneum is made, then the laparoscopes are introduced into the abdomen by taking two smaller incisions. In all, there are three incisions which are there in the abdomen, one for the light scope or the light and the other two are for the laparoscopic instruments. It gives an endoscopic view of the interior of the abdominal cavity. What is seen here in this picture is the endoscopic view or laparoscopic view of the uterus showing the fallopian tubes, the ovary with the round ligament of the ovary and we can also see the uterosacral ligament. So, this laparoscopic procedure is used not only to visualize the interior of the abdominal cavity, it is also used to undertake procedures like laparoscopic tubectomies, laparoscopic hysterectomies and other intrauterine operative procedures. So, that is the laparoscopic procedure, pelvic laparoscopy. We next move on to another radiological procedure which is the ultrasonography. Herein, there are sound waves which are sent through a trocar introduced into the body part. They are reflected back from the viscera, they are picked up by the machine and are seen on the computer screen as shades of grey which show the various visceral organs. When we need to do a sonography of the pelvic organs, especially to visualize the uterus, ovary and the fallopian tubes, these are always done with a completely full urinary bladder since the urine in the urinary bladder is going to give a characteristic contrast which helps in identifying the other pelvic organs. The picture shows here the various structures of the pelvis. The urinary bladder is seen anteriorly filled with urine. This is the posterior wall of the urinary bladder. Posterior to it, we see the myometrium and the endometrium part of the uterus. What are also seen here are the right and the left ovaries. 
and we also see the ligament of the ovary. Another picture showing you this ultrasonographic pictures. This is a schematic picture showing the anteriorly placed full urinary bladder. Posteriorly we see the uterus, the two ovaries with the fallopian tubes. The same is seen here as an ultrasonographic view. Anteriorly urinary bladder, the posterior wall of the urinary bladder and posterior to it we see the uterus and the ovaries with the fallopian tubes. So, this is a radiological procedure done to visualize the viscera of the pelvic cavity. We then go on to see the hysterectomy. This is nothing but the surgical excision of the uterus due to frequency of uterine and the cervical carcinomas. It is performed either through the anterior abdominal wall or through the vagina. It can also be done through laparoscopic procedure. While performing hysterectomy, care has to be taken not to damage the ureter. We have already seen the relations of the ureter to the cervix and also to the uterine artery which crosses the ureter from the anterior and superior aspect. There are three types of hysterectomy procedures as is shown in this picture. What is seen here is a partial hysterectomy wherein only part of the fundus and body cervix of the uterus is removed whereas the fallopian tubes and the ovaries are left behind. The second shows us a total hysterectomy where the fundus, body and cervix part of the uterus is excised. Whereas the third is a radical hysterectomy wherein all the parts of the uterus along with the adnexa that is the fallopian tubes and the ovaries are also excised. So, three types of hysterectomies, partial hysterectomy, total hysterectomy and radical hysterectomy. The commonest reasons for doing hysterectomy are a prolapsed, a completely prolapsed uterus giving rise to symptoms and also the carcinomatous changes either in the uterus or in the cervix are the main causes why hysterectomy procedures are undertaken. With this, we come to the end of the class. Just to summarize what we have done, we started with the introduction of the uterus, we saw its shape, size, the normal position of the uterus, we then went on to see the various parts of the uterus that is the fundus, body and the cervix. We moved on to see the uterus and its adnexa that is the fallopian tube, its parts and the ovaries. We went on to see the peritoneal relations of the uterus and the visceral relations of the uterus. Then, then we moved on to see the structure of the uterus, the histological structure of the uterus showing the endometrium, myometrium and the perimetrium. We went on to see the blood supply that is arterial supply and the venous drainage, the lymphatic drainage the nerve supply of the uterus and then we went on to see the supports of the uterus, the way they are classified and what are the functions of these supports of the uterus. And finally, we went on to see the various applied anatomy aspects related to the uterus and we also discussed the case scenario which we had seen at the beginning of the class. So, that summarizes the entire class of the uterus. Thank you.